it's the Wrath of God Sunday, uh, it may be a little bit difficult to get fired up about the wrath of God, but hopefully this morning as we look at the scriptures, uh, we will come to appreciate uh, this attribute uh, of Almighty God. Um, we've put some Bibles in the back of the auditorium, and uh, it, we're going to kind of start to do that moving forward. So if you need a Bible, please pick one up on the, the way in. If you can condition yourself to do that, that's great. If you need one, I think Mark's got some in his hand. He'll uh, be glad to, to put one in your hand uh, here this morning. Well, the scripture uh, talks about the wrath of God, as uh, Steve uh, pointed out. And uh, I want you to know and understand that, that what we're trying to do is we're trying to understand uh, certain things about the character of God. Now, oftentimes when we think of wrath, there's a negative connotation with wrath. Because when we think of wrath, we oftentimes think of, of anger, don't we? We think of uh, being angry. And uh, you, you remember the angry birds thing, right? Um, I never saw that movie, but I, I, everybody knows about the Angry Birds. I, I don't know what they did. When I think of bird movies, I think of uh, Alfred Hitchcock, I think. But um, <laughs> that was really scary. I was only about five years old back then. Uh, but God is not a God who, who displays anger indiscriminately. And, and that's one of the things I want you to know and, and understand about this attribute of God. Oftentimes, uh, when we think of anger, we think of it negatively because we're all trying, hopefully, to control our anger, aren't we? Uh, we're trying to be angry at the right things and not at the wrong things. We're trying to be angry with sin. We're trying to be angry at the, the right moment as opposed to being angry when we really shouldn't be angry. Uh, I had to laugh uh, this week. Uh, I was coming to church and somebody went from the far right lane across the center lane into my lane. And they, they were about 10 feet in front of me, but I had to hit the brakes really hard. And uh, I want to tell you, I didn't get angry at all. I was just very, just laid back. <laughs> But the funniest thing happened, that fellow went about 20 feet, and somebody else from that same lane that he came from must have thought it was a great idea. And he about plowed into him, missed him by two inches, and uh, he about it came over his steering wheel in the process. And uh, I just kind of nodded and, and went up my way. Now, I, I am fine. There are different times when I get upset. Maybe I'm like you. Uh, and I get up here by the wall wall, for instance, and, and that far right left lane is just a, 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 a real stumbling block. You know, people get in that, and they, they just want to burn you. You know what I mean? You're sitting there in line. And, and if I'm just sitting there in line, I usually am very composed. It really doesn't bother me. But if I'm the first one in line, and somebody else pulls up next to me, there just might be a race. <laughs> so the, the point is, at times in our lives, we become angry about different things. And isn't it funny how one thing can make us angry and can really set us off? And it can happen the exact same way the next day, and it doesn't seem to bother us in the least. Have you noticed that? That is very, very different from the wrath of God. God's wrath is one of his attributes. And as we'll see, the wrath of God is tied to his other attributes. It's interesting when you come to the New Testament, there's not actually one place in the New Testament that describes God as being angry. But we do find out from the New Testament as well as the Old Testament that God at times demonstrates his wrath. Wrath is always a noun. It's, it's never a verb when you read it even through here in the New Testament. I want you to think of the wrath of God as being substantive. It's significant, and it's tied, as I mentioned, to his other attributes. In fact, what we're going to find is that the wrath of God is a fairly common topic as you go into the New Testament, and it's important to note. For instance, here's Romans chapter 118. For the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men who suppress the truth in unrighteousness. The wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all, and I want you to think of that word all as being important, 
because it is, all ungodliness and unrighteousness. When you think about God and you think of the reaction that our holy God has towards sin, you want to understand that the wrath of God is his settled disposition towards all sin. In other words, God is opposed to all that is evil. Notice with me Romans chapter 5. Romans 5 says, for God has demonstrated his own love to us in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. It's actually a present participle, and I love to translate it in my mind. While we were still sinning, Christ died for us. In other words, God didn't wait for me to clean up my actor and somehow improve my standing before him. Jesus Christ died on the cross while I was still in a continued state of sinning. In fact, that is true for all humanity. And his love is what drives him to do that for me. Now, much more than, he says, having now been justified by his blood, we shall be saved from the wrath of God through him. Let's pray, shall we? Heavenly Father, we pray that you'd bless our, our time together this morning. Help us, O oh Lord, I pray, to understand what the wrath of God is all about, to be able to understand why this is part of your attributes. Give us a, a grasp of this, Father, I pray. And then as we look at the solution to your wrath, Lord, this morning, may we leave here challenged and appreciative of all that you have done for us. I pray this all in Jesus' name. Amen. I want you to stop and I want you to think about this verse of scripture here in Romans chapter 5. It's the only verse in the New Testament that links Jesus' death with deliverance from wrath explicitly. And obviously Paul here is telling us that this wrath is truly uh, an attribute of God because it is tied to a reaction. Now this is what I want you to know. If you walk away with nothing less than this this morning, I believe this is very important. The wrath of God is a reaction that a holy and righteous God has against sin. In other words, the sinner has to commit sin in order for there to be wrath. It's not that God is wrathful, that God is just angry. It's not as though God is just a, a, an angry uh, entity looking to pour out judgment upon the world. That's not the character of God. Wrath is always going to be in response to ungodliness. That's where it comes from. And it comes because God is absolutely holy. The wrath of God is revealed from heaven against how much ungodliness? All ungodliness. So it really doesn't matter how much. It's a question of if there is sin, there has to be from a holy God a reaction against that sin. And that reaction is always going to be wrath. It's not as though God sometimes is wrathful and sometimes is not. You and I, we get angry indiscriminately. Oh, that really ticks me off. Well, it didn't make you mad yesterday. Why are you mad today? Well, you see, we don't make a lot of sense. And that's why we try to control our emotions so that we don't become angry and sin against people and against our God. This is not what we're talking about here this morning. We're talking about because God is holy. We've talked about holiness, and we've talked about righteousness. God always does that which is right. We established that last week, that God is just. And because we established the reality that God is righteous, he always does that which is right, the wrath of God then must be right. In other words, this is the reaction that a holy God should have when sin occurs. There are examples in the scriptures of God dealing with the consequences of his wrath. Understand the progression. There's sin, and then there's the wrath of God. How many times does the wrath of God follow sin? Every time. That's right. And then there's judgment. Judgment. 
that is brought to bear. Adam and Eve sin in the garden. We, we understand that significance. Was, was the wrath of God apparent when they sinned? Absolutely. Did judgment come as a byproduct of that? Absolutely. You stop and you think about the Noahic flood. You have a worldwide flood because sin was abounding and the wrath of God was very real and judgment followed. When you think of Sodom and Gomorrah, that whole story, you have sin, you have the wrath of God. And upon the wrath of God, you have judgment. And so the judgment comes upon the earth. But pagans, as it were, are not the only ones who would be judged by God. Take your Bibles and go with me to Numbers chapter 16. There are two passages here in Numbers that I want to just make mention of because they demonstrate that God is a God who is opposed to sin, that the wrath of God is very, very real, and there are real consequences. In, in chapter 16, we have the situation with Korah's rebellion. Korah's there. He is accompanied by Dothan and Abiram. And there are 250 other people, some from the sons of Israel, leaders of the congregation. These are men of renown, the scriptures describe them as. And they assemble, and they come against Moses and Aaron. And they say to them... You have gone far enough, for all the congregation are holy, every one of them, and the Lord is in their midst. So why do you exalt yourselves, the question's asked, above the assembly of the Lord? What they're saying is, hey, we're all holy. What is your problem? Why are you leading us? Well, this created an enormous problem. And uh, Moses uh, speaks to Korah and basically says this, if you can read it on your own, but he basically says, we've got to let God decide who's holy. Now, I think that's a good idea, don't you? Let's let God decide who's holy. You're, dis- you're describing yourselves as holy. Uh, you've got the incense of the Lord there, and you're ready to burn the incense uh, to the Lord. And uh, it was not a pretty picture. So by verse 19, you have Korah assembled Uh, And he's assembled with all the congregation, and they're all standing opposite Moses and Aaron. And the Bible says they're, they're meeting there at the doorway of the tent of meeting. So it's a pretty significant place. Notice the next phrase. The Bible says the glory of the Lord did what? It appeared to all the congregation. Now that's, that, that makes the hairs on the back of my neck just stand up. You know what I mean? I mean, we're talking about the glory of the Lord. We're talking about the presence of the Almighty. And it is the presence of the Almighty that is is truly going to be the one who judges. God is going to judge this congregation. Verse 20 says, The Lord spoke to Moses and Aaron, saying, Separate yourselves from among the congregation, that I may consume them instantly. Do you get that? It's like, you, you two guys want to step back. <laughs> you you, you, you want to step back because I'm going to consume them all. Not, not, just, not just Dothan and Abiram and not just the 250 men of renown that have come against Moses and Aaron. I'm, I'm going to consume the whole congregation. I'm just going to, that's it. And you have to appreciate the heart of Moses, um, probably more than we oftentimes do. Uh, But Moses and Aaron fall on their face before the Lord and say, Oh God, God of the spirits of all flesh, when one man sins, will you be angry with the entire congregation? And you see the intercession of Moses there on behalf of the people. And the Lord spoke to Moses saying, speak to the congregation saying, get back (laughs) from around the dwellings of Korah, Dothan, and Byram. Get get away from them. Get away from their houses. Get away from their stuff. Don't even be near them. Because God heard Moses and Aaron and now the judgment was about to fall And God would allow the congregation to live. 
Verse 31 says, as he finished speaking all these words, the ground that was under them split open and the earth opened its mouth and swallowed them up. And their households, the men who belonged to Korah with their possessions, so that they and all they belonged to them went down alive to Sheol. And then the earth closed over them and they perished from the midst of the assembly. <laughs> I'm telling you this because I think we all need to understand the significance of the wrath of God. The earth opened up and Korah and the other two go down into the abyss. And their household sadly went with them, their families, and all their possessions. I mean, I'd hate to be a sandal, right? I mean, it's just like, phew. I mean, there you are. You're out in the middle of nowhere, and the earth opens up, and the Bible says not only did they get swallowed up by the earth, but they fell alive into Sheol. I can't even figure that out. Can you imagine being in Sheol, and all of a sudden, whoa, incoming. <laughs> like, get out of the way. Boom. It's like, whoa, what'd you do? I mean, we at least died first. So they died and then they end up in Sheol and they end up with all the rest. And God is still not done because you see the wrath of God as it's, it, it extends also to those 250, verse uh, 35. Fire came forth from the Lord and consumed the 250 men who were offering the incense. And so understand what we have. We have sin. We have the wrath of God. We have intercession. And we have judgment. Look over with me now at chapter 21. We pick this up in verse 4 where it says, Then they set out from Mount Hor by the way of the Red Sea to go around the land of Edom. And the people became, the Bible says, impatient because of the journey. It wouldn't probably have been a sin enough to, to ask when we're going to get there. But the problem was that they spoke against the Lord and Moses. And they asked this question, why have you brought us up out of Egypt to die in the wilderness? For there's no food, there's no water, and we loathe this miserable food. Their whole understanding had become reversed. They were 400 years in, in prison, basically, there in Egypt. That was their bondage. God was trying to lead them into a land that flowed with milk and honey. But instead, because of sin, they are delayed in going into the promised land as we would understand it. What they were looking at was Egypt in favorable light. They were looking at Egypt as being the place of plenty and blessing. And they were looking at their travels and where they were and where they were heading as the place of bondage. They had it confused. Their sin is that they would speak against Moses and specifically speak against God. And so God decides that what he's going to do is he's going to judge it. Remember, sin always brings a reaction from God, and the reaction is always what? Wrath. Sin brings about wrath. And then there is judgment. The Bible says the Lord sent fiery serpents among the people, and they bit the people so that many people of Israel died. That is not good. I hate snakes. If I see a snake, I want to be on a John Deere tractor with three blades spinning at a high, very high rate. I don't care if there's a bag catcher or not, but I prefer not. Something about seeing him displayed on the side of the, yeah, perfect. When I was in Africa, I heard a story one of the guys was telling about a black mamba. Uh, 
we went to a snake thing, you know, and you could see all these things. The guy took a python out of the cage, and he said, yeah, look at this python. I mean, I, this, this python is like 20 feet long, and it, it, it's just going along, and I'm thinking, I got to get out of here. I hate snakes, and I really hate those black mambas, especially after this story. The fellow tells a story that when he was a little boy, he and a buddy or two buddies went uh, through the jungle, and they were walking along, and they had the, their dog with them, and they heard some thud. And they turned around and looked, and this black mamba that was up in a tree fell down onto the ground. And the black mambas are different than other snakes. If I have a snake in my yard, it usually is trying to get away. Do they try to get away in your yard too? They're not very successful, but they try. Black mambas will track you. They will come after you. And so these boys saw the black mamba and they took off running because they knew what it meant and they ran as fast as they could. And pretty soon the black mamba was catching up near them. The dog turned around, started to fight the mamba. And he was bitten. By the time the boys got to the village, they ran into the village screaming for help. And as they ran in, the dog followed them in and fell over dead from the bite. Uh, if there's dogs in heaven, that'll be one. <laughs> Any dog that takes on a snake has got like some kind of special something. Here the Lord sends these fiery serpents upon the people of Israel and they're dying and they come to Moses and they acknowledge their sin there in the text because we have spoken against the Lord and you. Intercede with the Lord that he may remove the serpent from us. And Moses interceded for the people. And the Lord tells Moses exactly what he should do. He tells him uh, to, to make basically a, a statue uh, of, a, of a snake and put it on a pole. And this is what Moses does. He makes a bronze serpent and sets it on a standard and it came about that if the serpent bit anyone that when he looked up at the bronze serpent he lived wow they spoke against God they spoke against Moses there was sin the byproduct of that sin was wrath and then intercession on the part of Moses and judgment for the rest. Interestingly, when you think of that, you may think of the scripture in John chapter 3 and verse 14. As Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, even so must the Son of Man be lifted up. There was a temporary halt to the judgment over this transgression. By the time we come to the New Testament, we begin to see how the wrath of God is unfolding. In the church age, there is much to praise God for because we see in the scriptures very clearly how the wrath of God can be removed. There's actually a solution to this problem that we have, this, this wrath. Just as in the first time we have Moses and Aaron praying for the people, praying for the congregation, we have an intercession, and so those people are spared. In chapter 21, we have an intercession by Moses. He puts the, the bronze serpent up in the air. People look at it, and they're delivered from the consequences of the wrath of God. But we need something that's, that's even more permanent than that, don't we? We need something that is going to alleviate the judgment that is associated with the wrath of God. Let me say this. You and I should see the wrath of God as a positive attribute. And we should have a similar reaction against sin. Now, the difficulty for us, I believe, is our failure to recognize sin as sin. We struggle with that. We, we do. We struggle with that. I, I've been saved 52 years. I don't mind saying that. 52 years. Five decades plus, right? That's a little while. And, and I don't have to read a history book to realize uh, that certain changes have taken place in the church. It's been fascinating at times to watch, but churches have really changed in five decades. And uh, one of the things that we've become pretty good at is, is changing the definition of sin for certain things. 
And uh, I've noticed that. We should have a, like a Emancipation Sin Day or something, right? Where we're free from sin because we've changed the rules. You see, this is why the wrath of God is so important. The wrath of God is tied to the holiness of God. And as such, the holiness of God, my friends, is a straight edge, is it not? It, it, the things that were sin back in 1850 are sin in 1950, and they'll be sin in another hundred years. In other words, God's wrath comes about because of sin, and God knows what the sin is, and God knows what the sin is not. You and I tend to struggle oftentimes with understanding what is sin. We live in a world that is constantly redefining things in light of man's quote-unquote wisdom. We see that all the time, don't we? And so we have to be very careful. We also want to be careful not to make things sin that the Bible doesn't make sin. And we would say, that's legalism. We don't want to go there either. But what we want to do is we want to maintain an understanding through the power of the Spirit of the Lord and the Word of God to understand what sin is. And even then, we're going to have times of struggling to identify sin even in our own lives. There are things that you and I do that we're ignorant of. We don't, we don't even realize it's sin. And the Holy Spirit is causing us to see those things. And over time, we see those things, and hopefully we deal with them. That's that process of sanctification, is it not? God always understands exactly where the sin line is. And so his wrath is precipitated upon his holiness. So you and I struggle at times to know what exactly, where exactly is that line? What is sin so that I may be able to identify it? Now sin, in understanding the significance of sin, is important because we know that the wrath of God is always, always, always God's response to what? Sin. And that, if it's not checked, will lead to what? Judgment. As we look at what God has done for us, we would understand that huge long word in the Bible that we never use, but is very, very important. I'm talking about the word propitiation. For Jesus Christ truly is the propitiation for our sins. Now, we know that all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. We understand that. And the Bible says that uh, we can have eternal life through Jesus Christ, whom God displayed publicly as a propitiation in his blood through faith. Propitiation is a biblical term. It's an important word. Uh, but when you think of propitiation, Dr. Allen has this quote I like. Propitiation is a word that includes six things in its definition. God's holiness. Remember, you don't need propitiation unless God is holy. And he is, because he's holy and he deals with sin, there is then wrath. And so if there wasn't sin, would there be wrath? No. No, and God doesn't sin, so whose problem is it? Who's causing the wrath? But there's holiness, there's wrath, there's justice, which we would understand of the subject that we tackled last week, the righteousness of God. There is also mercy, there is also love, and there's also grace. All six of those terms are needed in order to define propitiation. Very important that we understand that. I love uh, 1 Thessalonians 1. For they themselves report about us what kind of reception we had with you and how, we, how you turn to God from idols. To serve a living and true God and to wait for his son from heaven, whom he raised from the dead. Speaking there about Jesus. And specifically, he says this about Jesus. He has rescued us from the wrath to come. Numbers chapter 16, we have sin. What follows the sin? The wrath of God. There's intercession, 
and then there's judgment. Here we are in the New Testament time period. Is there sin? There's none righteous, no, not one. That's pretty much all of us, isn't it? When it says, for all have sinned and come short of the glory of God, that's pretty much all of us. So we all have sinned. And the response from God towards that sin is wrath. And what follows wrath? Judgment. And so we're looking for the solution, and the solution has to be intercession. We get a beautiful hint of what's happening intercessory-wise back in Numbers chapter 21, especially when it's tied to John chapter 3, verse 14. You see, Jesus Christ, he is the one who is going to rescue us from the wrath to come. There's a couple of uh, words that are used in the scriptures that describe the propitiation and the expiation of from sin. Two words, halasterion and halasimus, both are used in the Greek, and it's somewhat confusing at times because uh, it's hard to identify the, the differences between propitiation and expiation. But I want you to think about it this way, and I'm sorry for getting into some theology, but some of you might remember this, and it, it might be helpful for you. The prefix ex means out of or from, Expiation has to do with removing something or taking something away. Uh, within the Bible terminology, it has to do with taking away the guilt uh, through the payment of a penalty or the offering of an atonement. By contrast, propitiation has to do with the object of the expiation. The prefix pro means for. So propitiation brings about a change in God's attitude so that he moves from being at enmity with fallen mankind to being for us. So this whole process, we should understand, is an act of Almighty God on our behalf. You and I, as sinners, offend the one true holy God. Whose responsibility should it be to pay for that offense? Our own. Our own. I'd pay for yours, but I can't pay for mine. My pockets are empty. So the one who should pay can't pay. There's only one who could pay, and that is God himself. You see, the dilemma that we have is that we don't have anything to offer. That's our problem. Let's say I invited you over for dinner tonight and you came in and you thought to yourself once you came into my house, you thought, boy, I really should have brought a, a gift. And so you, you look, kind of looked around the house and you look around the house, you go, oh yeah, there's something on the shelf. You walk over, you pull it off the shelf and you walk over and you give it to my wife. And she's like, what? That's really uh, how dumb it is to think that we could give God anything. God's created us all. We're the ones who fell into sin. You see, Adam's sin has, has trickled down and every single one of us has a, has a sin nature. But understand that God has created, he didn't create that sin nature, but he's created you. And he's created everything in the earth. What in the world are you going to be able to purchase through your good works, your good looks, all the money you have or whatever that could ever be a payment for your sin? The answer is nothing. Nothing at all could be used. So what does expiation and propitiation mean for me? Expiation is, is important. But if you have too much emphasis on expiation, it risks making God as only concerned with the legal aspects of sin. So Jesus just covers the sin. Propitiation is, means to, to make favorable, as we said, but we have to be careful because too much emphasis on propitiation risks making God a, a tyrant and only concerned with appeasement. 
This was the common usage of this word historically. You had some uh, despot who was looking for appeasement. Maybe he had a big army and he came against your city and he said, we're coming in there and and you sent an emissary out to say, listen, uh, we'll give you this region of the world over here if you'll just leave us alone. And oftentimes that was what placated him and he was satisfied and he went his way. And the judgment wasn't there. This is not about God as a tyrant needing to be appeased. What we're talking about is the removal of that which produces wrath, which leads to judgment. In other words, when we talk about it, we always start here with sin. Sin is the problem, isn't it? And that sin needs to be paid for so that the wrath is not a byproduct. And this is what happens when you place your faith in Jesus Christ. When Jesus Christ looks at you as a follower, when God the Father looks at you as a follower of Jesus Christ, he doesn't see that sin. You see, Jesus Christ took upon himself the sins of the whole world. Those sins were nailed to the cross. This is God's solution. If it wasn't for God, there would be no hope for you and me. We would simply bear the wrath of God in the form of a judgment. Do you see how that just simply works its way out? But just as there was that intercession in chapter 16 of Numbers and chapter 21, Jesus Christ, has done the work for us so that the sin is paid for, so there's no more the wrath of God toward those who are righteous in Christ Jesus. He's declared you righteous. We've, we, we discussed that last Sunday. He's declared you righteous, and he can declare you righteous because of the righteousness of Christ. How wonderful it truly is to know that the wrath of God is diverted. It's gone. It's no longer over us. There is now, therefore, now no condemnation to those who are in Christ Jesus. For that we should rejoice, amen? We rejoice. But understand as we, we go from this place, that the wrath of God is real. And we're going to meet people on a regular basis who are under the wrath of God. And unless the intercessory work of Jesus Christ on the cross becomes their object of faith, that is, Jesus is their object of faith, they will bear the judgment. And the judgment is eternity in hell. Sin, the wrath of God, and judgment. I am so thankful that between the wrath of God and between the judgment is Jesus Christ. The world needs to know that, don't they? They need to know that they're under the wrath of God. You see, people today don't even realize that they're under the wrath of God. And you may tell them, you may express that in a loving way, and they may think you're crazy, but my friends, listen, I am so grateful for the one who told me that I was under the wrath of God. And whether they used that terminology or not, I knew that I had a spiritual need. I knew that my sins needed to be forgiven. You and I are the vehicles that the Lord wants to use to warn the world of the judgment that lies ahead. Jesus spoke a lot about the judgment I was reading an article this week that said Jesus' theology was crisis theology. I thought, that's pretty good. Now, the word crisis is it's used all the time. In fact, it's part of motivational speakers. They don't have it right, by the way. If you, if you spend you know, $200 to listen to a motivational speaker and he mentions the word chi- uh, crisis in Chinese means uh, a decision that needs to be made and it's an opportunity and he links those two words... Al Gore did it with like three times about global warming and, and different ones have do this. It's, it's very 
this is kind of the catchy thing. And everybody goes, oh, wow, I need a decision. And even though it's a crisis, there's an opportunity. They link these Chinese letters together. It's bogus. <laughs> okay. It, that's not what it means at all. Um, the word crisis in the Greek actually is very, very close to the word judgment. They're, they're very much aligned. There is, without a doubt, in Jesus' teaching, warning after warning after warning about judgment. I, I, I was amazed. I look at, I, you, you, with a touch of the mouse, you can pull them all up, right? And it's like, oh man, it's going to take me an hour to read them all. And Jesus' theology, I agree, it, it, it was crisis theology in a sense. The sin that we're born with, conceived in, produces the wrath of God because God is holy. And judgment is something Jesus warns time and time and time again about. But Jesus says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. You and I place faith in Jesus Christ we're no longer under the God's wrath. And we look forward to not judgment, but the joy of being with the Lord forever. We look forward to the joy of living even today with a re right relationship with God. That's the difference. I'm thankful for the wrath of God because it speaks to his righteousness, his holiness. If God wasn't holy, there'd be no wrath. They're all interwoven together. And we see that in the doctrine of propitiation. God now is favorable to us, a sinner. He's not wrathful towards those who have been forgiven in Christ. We have a right relationship with him. We have a joyful relationship with him. Isn't that wonderful? You know, when somebody's mad at you, they, you, there's two ways people get angry. Have you ever noticed that? They either don't talk to you or they do. <laughs> and neither one of those things is usually very positive. God's wrath has been removed. He says, Kevin, come here. And I can talk to him and he speaks to me through his word. What a blessing it is to have a right relationship with God through Jesus Christ. Let's pray, shall we? This morning you may be here and you're not sure about your relationship to Christ. It's very possible you're here today and you've been taking gifts off the wall and giving it to the host trying to work your way to heaven you've been trying to do good things and you realize that there's still no peace in your heart my friend this morning I hope we realize that Jesus Christ is the only way to remove the wrath of God and forgiveness of sin is what we're speaking of have you come to Jesus Christ and called upon his name and being saved from the consequences of your sin. If you have, you know the joy of a relationship with Christ that has brought you full pardon and you know the mercies of God are real. But you may be here and you're not certain of where you'll spend your eternity. You don't know if your sins are paid for or not because you've been trying to pay for them yourselves and you're just not sure if it's been adequate. Maybe you have another philosophy altogether and it leaves you uncertain. If you're here this morning and God's been speaking to your heart, I'd love to pray for you today. I really would. It's my desire that there would be no one that would leave here this morning who is still under the wrath of God. But that all would be redeemed in Christ. Maybe you're here this morning and say, Pastor Kevin, God's doing work in my heart. I'm not sure, you're, maybe you're not even sure where you are on that spiritual journey, but, but God's doing a work in your heart. And you say, Pastor Kevin, pray for me today. I want to be sure that 
I'm not under the wrath of God. I want to be sure that my sins are forgiven. With our heads bowed, if you're here this morning and you say, Pastor Kevin, remember me in prayer, just slip up your hand. I'd love to pray for you this morning. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Let's all stand, shall we? We'll pray together. Father in heaven, we're reminded of the significance of our sin today. We're reminded of it because of the wrath of God. And we realize, Lord, this morning that your wrath is the right reaction towards sin. Help us, Father, as followers of yours, not to be satisfied, but Father, help us to grow closer and closer to you. May the Spirit of God, with the Word of God, instruct us in how we should live. That we might not disappoint you, but Father, bring you great joy. May our relationship with you deepen and grow. And Father, today we are thankful for the mercies that you provide through Jesus Christ. And we're reminded, Lord, that the sacrifice that was made on our behalf was, was made for the whole world. And whosoever will truly may come to Jesus and have their sins forgiven. May you work in these folks' hearts today who've asked for prayer. I don't know the situations of their hearts, but Lord, you do. They do. May you complete the work that you've begun in their heart. May they know today that they are on their way to heaven because they're not trusting in their good works or anything else except for Jesus Christ. Placing total faith in Jesus, not in any religion, not in any religious works, but in Jesus and Jesus alone. May you work in hearts. And may we leave here today with the answers that you've provided for us in your word. I pray this all now in Jesus' wonderful name. Amen.